crossroads of golf in this particular video fall into two different categories. Number one, the, the imaginary center line axis, I consider this the crossroad of golf. If you maintain these, these, these lines right here at this crossroad, you're going to play good golf. The second is, I'm hoping today might be your crossroad in golf, where you'll stop all the other avenues that you've been traveling down that have failed to give you the results that you wanted and come back here and, and, and join me in some of my more advanced lessons. And before long, you're gonna, it's going to be as though you've rediscovered golf once again, and you're going to take and start enjoying it as it was the first time you picked the club up. Remember how exciting that was? That was a great day. The one undeniable truth about golf is that people of all ages and throughout the ages have fallen in love with their game of golf. It may well be the best game mankind has ever devised. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that for a good many of you, you're out there struggling. You work hard trying to understand those things required to try to elevate your game to the next level and you run into one sticking point after another. There's some things in golf that must be done precisely if you're going to have an opportunity to groom a repeatable swing. And obviously that's your objective. One swing for every full shot in the back. The repeatable swing actually is what gives a golfer the ability to stand back, observe the shot that he wishes to pull off, and it gives him the ability to do so. There's one thing in golf that you can refer to as the cornerstone of golf or even the bedrock of a golf swing. That is retaining very fine balance throughout the swing. This you will not see in, in the, a good majority of average golfers. I'm sure you've heard the commentators on the PGA Tour. Often, obviously, they analyze the swing of the players. And at the end, they many times they'll top it off and they'll say, He's got the best balance I've ever seen. Nothing else compares. You don't hear it real frequently, but you do hear it now and then. You know, Davis Love III once told a story about when he was a younger man starting off, or a younger person starting out in golf, and, and, and he was speaking with his father about one thing or another. And his father, I guess, responded to him, and he says, Davis, listen, he says, I don't care what you do, but don't never let me see you off balance. That may well have been the most important golf instruction Davis Love ever received as a young man. Probably was. You can't do anything in life when you're off balance. When you're in an uncoordinated state. Moreover, folks, just the natural instinctive setup of the human body demands that you stay on balance. And when you don't stay on balance for whatever reason, the involuntary side of muscle control takes over and does everything it can to put you back on your center of gravity. It does so to, to, to stop you safe from tipping over and hurting yourself, falling over. I mean, take for example, you're walking down through your front yard, you step on a rock, maybe step in a down mole hole, and you twist your ankle and, and suddenly all the weight of your body transfers to the outside of your foot. And you go to tip over, and one of the first things you'll want to do is fall down, because that, by falling down, that's one of the ways that you can relieve the strain off that, that weight that's positioned on the outside of the foot. It's trying to protect the ankle. Now the other thing is, is, is if you low, overload a muscle chain, again, the involuntary side of muscle control is going gonna, is gonna to take control of your muscular system and do what it can so that you don't overstrain that muscle to a point where you severely injure it or maybe injure the joint that's connected to it. My whole point, folks, is this. I don't care what else you do in golf, and I don't care how meticulously you do it either. If you do not maintain a true center of gravity throughout your body during the swing, you simply are not going to swing the club very well. You will not, never, you'll never groom a repeatable swing, and that's what you've been in search of. 
Obviously most of you people have heard about the swing plane and it's pretty important to maintain a swing plane. Of course with the, with the shorter clubs your swing plane is going to probably be a, a little bit more upright. You're approaching the ball, you you're, might be bent over just a tad bit more. Say with, with a pitching wedge as you might be a 7 iron or, or, or a 5 iron. And then of course when you have the driver and you stand further away from the ball you may be a little more upright. But nevertheless, the swing plane is critically important in golf. Ideally, if you had a perfect swing plane, it, as you swung your club up into the back swing, when you reach transition or the top of the swing, if there, you could basically knock a ball off a tee back there if there was one positioned up in behind your back. Your club would go through a slot and it would always end up at exactly the same place. Now if you were swinging the same club time and time and time again, obviously the angle of your swing plane is going to remain constant time and again. But when you get out of balance, that swing plane goes to hell. And each time you get out of balance, depending on to how, what the degree is, the swing plane will modify accordingly. One of the other cornerstones of maintaining good balance is to keep the weight position on the insides of the feet. If the weight is not retained on the inside of the feet and it starts working itself to the outside during the backswing, you're headed for disaster. As I mentioned, and I'm going to show you a picture of this, folks. Right here, I've got a book called Eyewitness Visual Dictionary, The Visual Dictionary of the Human Body. And it was printed by Doling Kendersley, Inc. of New York. Ladies and gentlemen, right here is a picture of the human foot and this is a cross-sectional view down from the top of the foot uh, <coughs> or the top of the leg I'm sorry and as you see along the inside of the leg which also connects to the inside of the ankle joint it's almost dead in line with the big toe these were designed to be weight-bearing bones now on the contrary over on the outside of the leg running nearly parallel to the tibia is what's called a fibula. Now you, maybe you can't pick it up in this picture but the fibula is probably one quarter or one fifth of the size of the tibia. And it's also over here in line with the little toe. Well that alone tells you that the, the outside of the foot is not, weight, is not supposed to be a full load weight bearing type of a structure. The, here's a picture of the lower leg and foot. Running down to the, on the inside obviously is the tibia. That's connected with the ankle joint and the inside of the knee. On the outside of the of the uh, tibia lies the fibula. It's connected on the outside of the knee joint and it's also connected to the outside of the ankle. Again folks, that structure, that the fibula is not designed to be a weight-bearing bone. And when you allow your body weight to shift to the outside of your right foot, you're putting the weight onto the fibula, the outside of the knee joint, and every place other than where you want it. Now while this is occurring, you are at one and the same time modifying your swing plane all over the place. I mean it is so erratic and elliptical and, and there's so many different types of, mo of, of circular motion patterns going on that really for the truth of it is you, that they're indescribable. Ladies and gentlemen you have to maintain your body weight on the insides of your feet throughout the swing. Now as a natural flow of the body during the setup procedures because the right hand sits lower on the club than the left it automatically creates a tilt across the line of the shoulders. Let me show you. S setting up, right hand lower. It automatically tilts these shoulders and sets them on a different plane. Now depending on the angle 
your back angle, it's also going to establish at what plane angle you will swing on. Obviously, if you swing back this way, you could consider that a flat swing, whereas if you swung back this way, you would consider it an upright plane. But whether it's a flat plane or an upright plane, as long as the weight remains on the inside of the feet, you have a good chance of repeating that, that swing plane. I'm going to move back here a little bit. As a natural flow of the body, as my lower hand drops, my shoulder plane, the angle across my shoulder obviously tilts, and at one and the same time, the hips move in a forward direction, uh, very slightly in, in the direction of the target. This is hips in the direction, left hip in direction of target. If that's what you think, that's a good swing thought. Set up right hand low, tilt, the hips automatically move forward. Now when this does this, obviously there's some bend in your knees. But if you take and feel that your knees are working towards each other, you're going to be in good shape. Now I'm not talking about really going knock knee and locking your knees up. What I'm talking about here is all pretty much a natural flow that unless you stop it from happening will pretty much take care of itself because as you, you your shoulder plane starts to tilt the hips go forward and because the body is readjusting at one and the same time and trying to maintain its center of gravity it will almost bring your knees towards the center of its own accord it's almost like just a complete natural flow, which is unforced. Now, it's going to take you a time to get used to this, but it, nevertheless, I want to add something here, and that has to do with this next one. I want you to use your spine as what you might consider an imaginary center line fixed axis that you are going to rotate around. Now, once you're in this pre-established position, as discussed, I want you to think of your spine maintaining the angle that it has at address. Not, it's going to have a slight lean to it, obviously, not only in a forward direction, but the lower part of the spine, will, along with the left hip, will be closer to the target, and obviously the upper part of the spine will be a little bit behind that. It's going to be positioned as such. Now, when you swing or rotate your shoulders, you're going to rotate around that imaginary fixed axis. Now, as long as you maintain this fixed axis, it's going to guarantee that your left hip stays forward towards the target. It will not allow your hip to transfer to the right, which is the main one of the main faults in an average golf swing. The golfer takes a wonderful setup and everything else, and he's all ready to go. And he starts his takeaway into the backswing, and the first thing they do is this. What they've done, I'm going to do it again, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to turn sideways. I want you to watch this. I've, turned, I've rotated my shoulders. I'm on plane. And now I'm going to shift my hips well to the right. I mean, the plane is moving everywhere other than where it belongs, ladies and gentlemen. And you know movements that are that, that great in such a short time period at a relatively high speed are absolutely non-repeatable. Now, the thing is, is if you maintain your imaginary fixed axis, at one and the same time, you're going to be maintaining your center of gravity. And that is the most important thing in golf. If you don't shift your imaginary center line axis, your weight's going to remain on the insides of your feet. You're going to maintain your center of gravity, and you're going to be in a position where your plane will remain the same. And if you can pull all that off, my friend, your game's about to improve. Will it feel funny at first? Well, of course it will. If you burn your finger, will it feel funny? If you poke yourself with a needle, will it feel funny? Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. Please, I say this respectfully. You've been on a pathway of confusion for a long time. 
It's not that you haven't worked hard. You have every desire in the world in order to raise, to raise above, to continue your climb up the ladder. But you haven't understood it. And my lessons, hopefully, are going to start bringing you the understanding that's necessary to get your thoughts running in the right direction and get you on a pathway of understanding so that when you go to the practice tee, you're going to go there equipped with the knowledge that you need to swing the club well, and you will do it. The other thing I want you to remember, this is just will help aid you in moving this stuff through temporary short-term memory and the long-term memory. When you get set up here, you imagine the, your shoulders on this tilt angle. Now, if you practice out in the backyard in slow motion with a setup similar to what I got, then you can actually see, without turning your head, you can actually see the ends of these sticks with your peripheral vision. And now you can just keep your head still and, and rotate your shoulders and you can see with your peripheral vision that you're staying on the proper plane. You'll also notice that in doing so by maintaining the plane, obviously it maintains the center line axis. At the same particular time, if you maintain the center line axis, you maintain the, the plane. None, neither one more important than the other. My point to you is, is, is that it's going to take you a while to ingrain this through the, through the short-term memory, long-term memory, and then put it up here somewhere in the back of your mind. And then sooner or before long, you're going to start doing the things I'm telling you through the use of body feelings. It won't require conscious thought of this fundamental again. If your swing falls apart, you're going to have to go back and review it. But until that particular time, you'll swing through body feeling. And that's what you're trying to do. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I got to go. Thanks for tuning in here. Welcome to Earth, Third Rock from the Sun.